My name is Perry Ha. I am the board chair of Korean American Community Foundation of San Francisco. I am thrilled to welcome all of you to our sixth annual gala. We were hoping to meet in person. Unfortunately, we felt we are not quite fully safe from the pandemic, so we decided to hold our gala virtually. We're so grateful that you were able to join us. We're here today to celebrate the positive changes we are making in our community. This year's gala theme is to rise together. For that, we have an exciting program this evening. We honor David Lee and Corey Lee, two visionary leaders who embody innovation and resilience. Also, we will hear from two of our U.S. representatives in Congress, Marilyn Strickland and Andy Kim, as well as from Daniel Day Kim, who exemplify what it means to use our voice for a collective change. Thank you for your support and please enjoy the gala. And now I would like to turn it over to our gala co-chairs, Sungjin Engrisali and James Kim. Thank you everyone for logging in tonight from wherever you are, hopefully in the comfort of home or in a pod with friends. We wanna take this time to acknowledge and thank all of our generous sponsors who have made this evening possible. To Marcy and Young Son, our presenting sponsors and true community leaders. To our platinum sponsors, Perry Ha, Sung Jin and Frank Ingrizelli, Altos Ventures, Bank of America, New Horizon Studio, and Catalyst Partners. Thank you to our gold sponsors, Eunice and Andrew Kim, Sophia o Kim and Sung Kim, Soyoung Park and Brian Byung, Central Medical Center, Goldman Sachs, Good Water Capital, Kirkland and Ellis, Northern Life Venture Capital, and Acacia. And to our silver sponsors, Sally Carson, Lillian and David Chung, Angie and John Kim, Annie and James Kim, Susan Kim and David Lee, Mike and Albert Lee and family, an anonymous donor, GS Futures, Henley's Auto Group, Rachel Han and Intero Real Estate, LG Technology Ventures. And thank you to our patron sponsors. and wine sponsors. It is because of all of you that KCF SF can continue to build a more connected and empowered Korean American community in the Bay Area. And a special thank you to the hardest working staff. And now we pass the podium to our executive director, Lena Park. Thanks, Hongjin and James. We could not have done this without you and our incredible gala committee. Thank you, Sophia o Kim, Soyoung Park, Caroline Shin, and Perry Ha. And thank you to all of our community leaders, partners, and supporters who are joining us this evening. Today, we celebrate the achievements of our honorees and recognize our grantee partners who are on the ground tirelessly working for our community. As a grant maker, we fund nonprofit organizations that provide bilingual and bicultural mental health and legal services to low-income communities, senior lunch and wellness programs, and culturally competent services for survivors of domestic violence. This year, we formed the Bay Area K Coalition to strengthen ties amongst Korean American leaders, raise our visibility, and build allyship with the greater community. In fact, here's a glimpse of the work we do and why we are here today. San Francisco, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. We know it as the mecca of technology, commerce, and creativity. Steeped in history, yet modern, thriving, and iconic. But below the surface, something else is happening, and it's the side of the Bay Area that few have seen. Isolation. Isolated by the language barrier, isolated from family who have moved away, isolated by the pandemic, isolated by the cost of living. San Francisco is not only one of the wealthiest cities in America, it's also one of the most expensive. In fact, one in five Korean seniors live below the poverty line. 22% of our community is counted among the lowest income bracket. Facing challenges like these without assistance, many have no one to turn to and nowhere to go for help. Left alone or worse, ignored, a new challenge arises, declining mental health. In fact, 33% of Koreans experience some form of clinical depression. In 2018, only 0.2% of the $88 billion distributed by philanthropic foundations 
went towards addressing AAPI issues. It doesn't have to be that way. That's why we're here tonight, to raise our community up and to do it together. Today, KACFSF has distributed nearly $2 million in grants to Korean-based services focused on mental health, senior care, domestic violence, legal aid, and more. With your support over the last year, we have partnered with nonprofits to serve over 50,000 hot lunches to homebound seniors during the pandemic. We've assisted over 200 Korean immigrants obtain their citizenship, and we've trained 60 new Korean-speaking senior care providers. And when COVID-19 hit, we founded the Bay Area K Coalition to unify our community, share resources, and take collective action on behalf of vulnerable Korean American individuals, families, and businesses. If anything, this year has taught us to be proactive. For 2022, we are developing innovative solutions like telehealth counseling, mentoring the next generation of community-minded leaders, helping the survivors of domestic violence get their lives back, and supporting our seniors to provide the quality of life they deserve. With your continued generous support for KACFSF and our partners, we are rising together. together. Thank you. This is the work you are supporting today. Together, we are raising our voices to make our community stronger and ensuring that Korean American voices are helped and heard. I'm honored today to introduce David Lee, a good friend of mine and someone who personifies leadership in our community. He's a very successful entrepreneur, and he and his wife, Susan, are longtime supporters of KCF SF. I've known David now for many years. We first met when he was the CFO at Zynga, and in his next role, David was instrumental to the success and transformation of Impossible Foods as their COO and CFO. Today, David is the president of App Harvest, a tech company with a mission to transform the future of agriculture. David wants to change the world through his work. He's one of the kindest, most thoughtful, and hardest working people I know. And I'm thrilled to honor David Lee and his accomplishments today. My family came over from Korea in 1965. Um, it was when the United States couldn't field enough primary care physicians to serve rural America. My name's David Lee, and I work in sustainable food technology. I'm a president at a company called App Harvest, this new public company. David is incredibly decisive. He is also highly persuasive. He is a master communicator, a guru of the soundbite, of the pithy quote, of the um, really inspirational message to, to the team. And of course, he's also a brilliant chief financial officer. I was definitely raised as um, a biologically Korean kid who was culturally 100% American. And I regret that. I, I wish I had learned to speak Korean. I, I wish I learned to cook and eat Korean food far earlier. Uh, but I understand why my parents made that decision. You know, it was awfully hard for that first generation to be able to acclimate to a brand new culture. Uh, and it helped them by speaking English entirely at home. As I become a parent, and I've spent more time trying to contribute back to this Korean American community, I, I definitely feel a part of it. Uh, and I feel an obligation to help. He was a little obsessed with food, frankly. He was always wondering if we were gonna run out of food. And so he always, when we would cook big family meals, um, which we tended to do, uh, he would always be asking me, so did you, did you get enough? Did you make enough? Because, you know, we have a lot of people coming over. And uh, so it was a running joke in our family that um, Dave was always on the alert that we were gonna run out of food. And now he's interested in he's, making he's sure that everyone... He's sure that everyone will be fed. <laughs> you know, by 2050, we're going to have 9 billion people. Uh, that means we need 60 or 70% more food. And the fact is, we already use 70% of all fresh water today in agriculture and food production. So for me, it's a combination of passion, but it's a combination of passion and mission. We, we have to do something. Uh, and we can with technology. Rising together means leading from the middle of the pack, you know, helping those who are struggling at the very end, uh, at the back of the line, um, pushing forward the great leaders we come across. Uh, it's about doing it collectively. You know, this idea of great icons who plant a flag in a hill and command others to, to come to them, that's, that's not rising together. Uh, but rising together means that we help the whole community together. Uh, and I think KCFSF is a really good example of doing that. 
um, in a way that's tangible, that's local, but is at a large scale. My name is Gideon Yu, and I have the enormous honor of saying a few words about my dear friend, Corey Lee. I guess my first recollection of Corey was when our mutual buddy, Chang Ray, put us all in the same golf foursome, and I overheard Corey making some sort of reference to being in food service. So, like a moron, I tried to make conversation and ask him about what part of food service he's in. Um, about an hour later, when I actually figured out that this was the same Korean guy that I'd heard about, the one from French Laundry, from Bennu from Per Se, that had won multiple James Beard Awards, I was like, why didn't somebody freaking tell me this? Anyone who knows Corey wouldn't be surprised to know that his response to me was, well, uh, Gideon, that's because it doesn't matter. Um, I guess the story really sums up all you need to know about Corey. His fabulous accomplishments are piling up more and more each day, each year. This dude is flying all around the world, opening up multiple new restaurants. Uh, in 2021, of all years, in this year, he's opening up multiple new restaurants all over the world. Um, and amidst all that, Corey has managed to have more perspective, become more humble, and best of all for our community, give more back. I wish I had a whole hour to give you dozens of stories that illustrate all this, but I was told to keep this to about a minute, so I'll leave you with this. When I asked him how the pandemic lockdown was affecting his various restaurants, he talked solely about the workers at the restaurants, especially the lower level ones and how hard it was for their families and how he's gonna keep them employed no matter what. If anybody was to help Corey or Bennu or whatever, it would be to give directly to the workers, to these guys and their families. Throughout the whole pandemic, this was his primary focus. I mean, what, a, what an amazing human being. Anyway, like I said, I wish I had more time for more stories, but I'll stop here and introduce the following video that gives you some more insight into his accomplishments. Congratulations, Corey. Well deserved, my friend. My name is Corey Lee, and I'm the uh, chef and restaurateur of Venu Restaurant. I was born in Seoul, and we came over as a family in 1982, so I was, I was still very young. My father worked for a large construction company and they opened a branch office in New York and that's when our family came with him. I never had any aspirations to be a chef. I never really spent much time in the kitchen. And then after I finished high school, I took a, just a random job and it happened to be in a restaurant. Um, and that summer is when I started in the restaurant business and, and I haven't left since. I think it's just that he's a genuine artist. Um, you know, all that creativity, all that inventiveness, all that um, focus and attention to detail, married to his incredible work ethic and um, unrelenting pursuit of something unique uh, is, is what he does. And certainly being a three-star restaurant is, is a huge honor and it comes with a lot of responsibility. And, and then um, being uh, the first Korean person to, to achieve that, that also comes with a different kind of responsibility because you know, overnight you have a, a lot of young Korean chefs who, who want to work for you and um, come visit your restaurant. And I, I think it's important to send them the right message and uh, for them to kind of understand um, you know, what's involved in, in choosing this profession. Uh, and what's involved in committing yourself to opening a restaurant. Um, so I, I try to not only teach them the technical skills that allow them to produce dishes, but imparting them an understanding of how restaurants work and, and the kind of commitment that's really needed to, to be successful. Um, I think that's my most important contribution to, to the community is, uh, is really training kind of the next generation of people who will influence how we eat, how we dine, and how restaurants um, interact with their own communities. So he is very different than other chefs, to be honest. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I work with a lot of uh, uh, like star chefs before. I would say Corey Lee is a, probably one of the best chefs in the world. Well, I think the, I think the first step in getting involved is just um, education and, and actually looking into becoming more aware, uh, more aware of um, what the community needs. Um, and you know that that really applies to me as well. Um, I think for so long, uh, you know, as Asian Americans, you, you're worried about um, you know the, the stereotypical things, which is uh, doing well in school, doing well in life, doing well in your profession. And, and 
I think it's it's easy to forget if you're if you're if you're on that trajectory, how many people that look just like you that are from your same background um, are underserved and in need. Um, and I think it's just becoming aware of that is is the first step, and that's probably the the most important call to action. Kim Jong Jae, go yo. 76년도에 왔어요. 1년 있다가 우리 애들을 초청을 했는데 그게 안 돼가지고 굉장히 어렵게 비자가 안 나와서 그게 어렵게 됐었어요. 영어 모르니까 힘들죠. 어, 여기 와갖고 제일 어려운 거는 내일 잡는 게 거의 다 한국. 사람들 일하는 대로 들어가는 것도 힘들고 자녀들도 오지도 않고 그러는 판인데 이 점심 도시락을 돌려주는 논아주는 게 얼마나 큰 힘인지 몰라요. 어떠고 모든 저게 발이 묶여 있는 상태잖아요. 이렇게 해주니까 우리는 그게 너무 기쁘고 너무 고마운 거예요. 우리 노인의 아파트에는. 잘 걸음도 못 걷고 내가 아는 한은 조금이라도 도와주려고 그러니까 우리는 거의 다 알니까 한 동에 몇 명씩 이렇게 해서 분리해가지고 그렇게 나눠주고 그래 자원봉사자들이나 이렇게 도움을 주는 사람들이 기쁨으로 다 하는 거지 그게 누가 하라고 해서 하는 게 아니잖아요. 그러니까 나이 먹고 젊고 그거 상관없이 기쁨으로 하는 거죠. 음. WS를 만나기 전의 상황은 신체적, 정신적 트라우마로 인해 병원에서 몇주 동안 입원해서 치료를 받고 있었어요. 저의 건강 상태는 걷거나 말하기가 거의 불가능했었고 매일 온몸에서 피가 났었어요. 공포와 절망의 하루하루였습니다. 음. AWS와 인연을 맺은 지는 4년 정도입니다. 주택 프로그램을 포함한 언어 지원, 정기적 사례 상담 등 의식주를 포함한 교육, 경제, 교통 법률 등 폭넓은 서비스를 지원받았고 덕분에 지금 보시는 것처럼 안전한 곳에서 건강하게 지내고 있습니다. 지금 당장 AWS가 없다면 저는 길거리에서 살고 있거나 가해자에게 보복당해서 세상에 없을 것 같아요. 제가 여러분들 앞에서 이렇게 말할 수 있는 용기는 AWS를 포함한 많은 분들의 도움이 있었기 때문입니다. 저는 모든 한인들이 공정한 권리와 혜택을 누려야 한다고 생각하며 이를 극복하기 위해서는 AWS를 포함한 한인 커뮤니티들을 하나로 연대시키고 지역사회 구성원 분들의 목소리와 관심이 필요하다고 생각합니다. 고맙습니다. Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland was born in Seoul to an African-American father and Korean mother who met in the aftermath of the Korean War. As a young child, she was continuously reminded of the hardship minorities in America face. But her parents taught her to work hard, fight for what's right, serve the community, and to stand up for the underdog. In fact, when Strickland was sworn into Congress as one of the first Korean-American women members, she famously wore a traditional Korean hanbok in honor of her mother. Representative Strickland serves as a member of the House Committee on Transportation and Infrastructure in addition to the House Armed Services Committee. She is also a member of the Congressional Black Caucus, the Congressional Asia-Pacific American Caucus, 
and the Bipartisan Historically Black Colleges and Universities Caucus. I think our challenge here is going to be helping people understand that when we talk about racial equity, this is not a zero-sum game. When we address racial disparities, it uplifts everyone, and that's good for the entire country. Congressman Andy Kim was born in Boston, Massachusetts, to Korean immigrant parents. He's a Rhodes Scholar, a Truman Scholar, as well as a Ph.D. graduate of Oxford University in England. He became the first Korean-American congressman from New Jersey by defeating two-term incumbent Republican Tom MacArthur in the 2018 elections. Kim's 2020 victory made him the first Democrat to win a second term in his district since the Civil War. Andy Kim has been a tireless advocate for not just only Korean Americans, but for Asian Americans too. Through our In Our Hands Political Action Committee, he is fostering the next generation of AAPI leaders in government and raising awareness about the importance of political participation in solving the issues that impact our community. Representative Kim participated in KACF's K Coalition virtual vigil. He's a member of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus and a member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Small Business Committee. That's why, you know, you see me get emotional when I talk about my kids is that the work that I do in Congress, this isn't just about laws and that we're writing and words on a piece of page or speeches that I give. I see this as my way of being a dad and, and trying to shape the world that they grow up into, whether that's about health care or climate change or about racism in our nation. So this is all deeply personal to me. And um, that is where I draw my strength from. That is where, well, that is my North Star. I'm just so pleased to be your host for today's conversation. Um, before we begin, I wanna congratulate U.S. Representatives Marilyn Strickland and Andy Kim on being recognized with the KACSF's Distinguished Community Leadership Award. And I also want to thank Daniel Day Kim for joining us today as our special guest participant. So let's go ahead and welcome our guests up to the virtual stage. So we're here today in the midst of rising anti-Asian hate, a hunger for greater visibility, and our need to lift each other up together, not just the Korean American community, but in collaboration with other communities as well. And I know the audience here is really wanting and yearning to hear from all of you amazing role models, um, what we can do. They're all ready to go and they want to know what we can do in order to actualize all the energy that has happened over the last couple of years. But I thought it would really be a good thing for us to start with them to get to know you a little bit first, and then we'll go on to the, to the activism part, if that's okay with you all. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Right. So it's great to have you here. So first, I want to start off um, with the idea of Koreanness, and I want to do it with you as our incredible role models. Andy, like me, you were born in the United States. Uh, Marilyn and and Daniel, you were born in Korea, and then you came to the United States when you were very young. We we all grew up in a different in different parts of the country, but we all had to figure out how being Korean fit into our lives. And my guess is that it happened at different times. And so I think it would be really nice for the audience to hear, um, you know, how your Korean identity shaped you into the person you are today. And was there a defining event in your childhood or, or as a young adult? So Andy, why don't we start with you first? Yeah, well, thank you. And, and I'm glad to be a part of this. And so great to see Marilyn and, and Daniel. Um, you know, for me, I feel like I first came to understand being Korean by what it wasn't. You know, I, I grew up in a predominantly uh, white community and, and uh, where the major issue about race was, you know, about being white or being black. And, you know, I, I think I just felt like I wasn't part of the racial equation. I didn't know where I belonged. And I think I just, you know, felt like I was on the sidelines on that. So I kind of initially came to understand it in sort of a, in sort of a, uh, just an absence kind of way, but you know, I, I belong to a, you know a Korean American church, and that was certainly one of the the earliest identities about it. But I'll be honest, you know, for I feel like my understanding of being Korean American, Asian American was very ill defined growing up. 
I, I sort of saw it as, as sort of just like a box of check. It wasn't until I was much older and I got to go to Korea and got to go with my mom and she took me to where she grew up and she showed me her house, which was at that point just, uh, you know, literally a pile of wood and rubble up in the mountains. Um, that's when it really just hit me that I'm, I'm just one generation away from this and then that this is, this is where I was connected. And it wasn't until I was literally standing on that rubble, my mom pointing, you know, that part of the rubble was my room, you know, that part of the rubble was our kitchen, um, that I really came to understand this. So that was kind of my story. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Marilyn, um, I note that you wore a hanbok at your swearing in um, uh, in 2018. So clearly being Korean has been a very important part of you. Can you tell us um, how that came to be and, and how it shaped you? Well, my story is a little different because I am biracial or I'm Blasian. So I'm half black and half Korean. And I was born in Seoul and our family moved to the United States when I was a baby. And we landed in Virginia in the 60s. And I often tell the story of my father wearing his army uniform, my mother wearing a dress and being a baby. And my mother tells me this story. And they drove around all night because they couldn't find the motel room. And finally, someone was willing to rent a motel room to them. And in the conversation about, quote, Koreanness, I often say that if you are raised by a Korean woman, you are Korean. And I think about the fact that, you know, during the time when I grew up, there was a lot of conversation about assimilation. My mother's friends all took American names, but my mother in her very predictable militant way refused to take an American name. And so for me, the whole conversation about Koreanness is something that was more private, right? Very obvious at home with the food we ate, with you know the habits we had, and even you know having my mom sing Arirang to me or San Toki Toki Ya, very, very, very traditional things that you know young Korean kids do. But I think about the, at that moment, when that identity just really came full bloom. And I think about the first time I ran for city council back in 2007 and how it brought together people from all walks of life. And that identity of being Korean was just amplified because there was so much pride in the Korean community that I was going to be the first. And then I was elected mayor as the first. And then I, I went to Congress as the first. And that's really what inspired me to wear hanbok on the house floor when I was sworn in this past January to send a message to my mother so she could see me on television and to remind the world that the U.S. House of Representatives is the people's house. It belongs to all of us. Daniel, let's start off with you on this. I mean, Hollywood is notorious for typecasting <laughs> actors, right? Um, you, yeah, you know, really, yeah. <laughs> you, early, you early on broke the mold and played very strong and positive leading roles. And, but you know, breaking out as everyone will attest to is never easy. People are telling you something that you necessarily don't want to hear. Was there a specific instance that affected you in a particularly difficult way? I can tell you that um, most people would think that those kinds of challenges would have existed in the beginning of my career and predominantly only then. But I can tell you that to this day, almost literally to this day, I have experiences where my ethnicity affects the roles that I play, the amount of, the amount of money that I get paid, uh, and the kinds of opportunities that are available to me. Because I like to think that I'm still climbing in my career. And so as I try to reach higher, the opportunities, uh, you know, I get a little bit choosier and those opportunities are fewer. So you're, you're fighting even harder to get those roles that you feel that you're you're passionate about and connected to. And and to fight in those spaces, you really do see the way that it's, and this, this phrase gets thrown around a lot, but the, the, the system is, mm -hmm. is geared against having people who look like us play heroes or leading men, romantic leading men, and you know, I would say that there's been a lot of progress that we've made in terms of supporting characters. And you see Asian faces populating certain TV shows, but how many do you see leading? And so mm -hmm. um, this, is, this is something that I would love to be, see become normalized and not just for Asian Americans, but for all people of color and all dispositions. There are a lot of different stories out there to tell. Right now, I mean, up until very recently, we focused very specifically on white stories and white male stories and and i think it's important that we create those stories where 
where someone where people who look like us are front and center. So mm-hmm. it's a it's a it's a multi headed hydra, you know, and you have to attack it. I think th- this issue from all different angles representation like for instance when you think of a politician in the united states do you is the first person you think of someone that looks like andy or marilyn you know and we have to change those perceptions and the way and part of the way we do that is by actually pursuing those professions and actually populating them and making an impact Mm -hmm. in those ways and i'm sure you're going to get to that question later so i don't want to jump the gun okay or monopolize the time so thank you <laughs> okay so so marilyn as as a woman as african-american as a korean american local politics and later national politics you are a stereotype smasher as well and um, i'm sure there is a story of racism or prejudice um can you share that with us as well Yeah, you know, thank you for this question, because, you know, often when we talk about racism and prejudice, especially in the United States, we think it wears a hood and a robe and burns a cross. And it can be anywhere. It can be subtle and it can even be it can either happen with people who we think are our allies, whether it's intentional or not. And so as I think about some of the different experiences that I've had, you know, I think about being in fifth grade and having dinner at one of my friends' homes, and the father and the brother start using the N-word like it's nothing. I pretended I got sick and had to leave. I remember being in high school, and it was like, you know, high school girls being high school girls, and I would get prank phone calls, and someone would leave messages with my mom, or even to me, and hang up, and they'd say, you pick, pick, pick a derogatory term for someone who's Asian, but not Korean, right? So this, this, and this. And then I even think about the fact that, you know, every time I have run for office, someone has tried to talk me out of it because there was no way I was going to win. And you layer racism, you layer sexism on there and all the different ways that people kind of think about women and women of color, right? Think about the stereotypes that people have. There's the submissive Asian flower. There's the fiery Latina. There's the hypersexual black woman. And so you just roll those stereotypes into what people perceive And, you know, it put me in a very, very odd position. Now, I've overcome all those things. But when I think about the conversation about racism, it just comes in so many different forms. And I'm not saying that, you know, as a person, as a woman, as a woman of color, that I have to, you know, be hypersensitive and speak out every time it happens. But people need to be called out for it, because if we don't speak up, these things will continue. And sometimes the worst kind of racism happens with people, you know, who would never consider themselves racist. So Andy, you and I, you and I have already talked about this in in other occasions. But one experience that hit home for me was the story you talk about at the State Department, um, and you know, uh, and sort of the stereotyping there. I mean, if you want, I mean, can you tell us about that? And if there's something else that you want to relate, you know, please, please do so. Yeah, happy to share that story, and it's one that I honestly didn't talk very much about until yeah. this year. Um, but when I was uh, at the State Department almost 10 years ago, you know, I, I'd just gotten back from Afghanistan, you know, worked for my country in a war zone, put my life on the line. And I came back and I was working at the State Department in D.C. and I found a letter at work one day on my top of my keyboard. And I remember opening it and I started reading it and my jaw just dropped because the letter was informing me that I was banned from working on issues related to Korea. And I was, I didn't understand what it was coming from. I was not applying for a job to work on Korea issues, um, you know, and, and I'd already gone through multiple security backgrounds as anyone there at State Department does. So it just was so, I mean, it was so disrespectful that like while I was serving my country in Afghanistan, while I was putting my life on the line, I have top secret security clearance, while I was doing all that, my country for some reason was proactively investigating me, unprompted, at least as far as I know. And, you know, it just was this sense that, like, that I just couldn't shake my last name, you know, that I happen to have a last name of a access to evil dictator and, you know, and in foreign policy, you know, it's just this idea that, like, therefore, there's just some suspicion that comes with this. And, uh, and it was just, you know, it made me feel like that I wasn't 100% American, that I wasn't 100% a State Department officer, that I could not do 100% of the things out there. I could only do 80% of it. And it, you know, it it got to the point where, you know, it almost made me want to leave. Mm -hmm. And it almost made like, I just, all I, I wanted them to just give me an explanation and to apologize. And, 
you know, it's I have to say, you know, I'm in I'm in Congress now, and I'm on the arm I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee, and I now have oversight over this. So I'm trying to get this fixed um, because so it's not just me; it's others. Did they? Did you get an apology? Did they tell you? Never. Give you an explanation? No. Never. No. I mean, in fact, I was told that I can't. I can't appeal it unless I actually was applying for a job on Korea. Right. So like I couldn't actually appeal it. And, I, and as I raised it to bosses of mine, I was told, you know what, if you don't want a job in, on Korea issues, then just let it be. That's literally what they would say. Mm -hmm. And I hate to say it, but part of me, you know, did just kind of say like, okay, look, I'm just going to kind of grind it out. And, and that's what I feel bad about looking in hindsight is that I felt like the power wasn't on my side. I felt yeah. like no one would listen to me if I raised it. So why bother? And that kind of apathy mixed with these issues, I think is something a lot of us have felt mm -hmm. where, you know, we've had an incident yep. where we look back on it, you know, even just recently, you know, I'm not, not recent at the beginning of the pandemic, I had an, ish, an incident when I was on a train and I sat down next to a woman who saw that I was Asian American, just started yelling at me, telling me to get away from her because, you know, she, she thought she was going to get COVID from me. And I wish I could tell you that I said the right things and I confronted her and it was a learning moment, but mm -hmm. I, I moved because I was, I wanted to avoid a conflict yeah. in a public space. And I don't know about you, but I replay those incidences in my mind constantly and yeah. i constantly wonder like what were the right words for me to say to her you know what could have gotten through what what should i have said to the state department and so i use those as learning experiences trying to train me for the next time to just you know be better um but i, I still carry that weight and that baggage as i'm sure you know daniel and marilyn have have similar type episodes that you know mm -hmm. sometimes you can't you just can't get past little awareness and probably and very little funding to support critical Asian American issues. I mean, KCF, SF, um, KCF does these kinds of things um, and and gives money towards uh, you know pressing issues. For example, many people may not be aware that poverty is a huge problem mm -hmm. for Korean American seniors. Yeah. And so when we look at the context of all these different things that are going on with our communities and how we might be able to help at different levels, you at a very societal level, us at one-on-one -on -one, um, kind of interactions, what can we do to inspire the next generation of civic-minded uh, leaders? How can we get them to act? And what advice would you give them in terms of those who want to go into to, to career public service? So Marilyn, maybe I'll ask you, you you're agreeing with me on this. <laughs> represent the fastest growing group grow fastest growing group of voters right now. Georgia flipped from red to from red to blue and the Asian American population, especially Korean American in Gwinnett County, had a big hand in that. And so how you get involved doesn't necessarily have to be in one lane. You can run for office, you can work on a campaign, you can work for someone who's a member of Congress. You can be a staffer for one of the many committees that happen. But it's just finding that place and understanding that whether it's local office, state office, or federal office, the work that we do as elected officials has an impact on everyone's daily life. And okay. in many ways, there's a responsibility we have to step up. Daniel, thoughts? Our desire to speak up and and our, our not being present enough in that moment to speak. I mean, Andy, you spoke of it in your story. And I think it's one of those things that is hardest the first time. Right. And once you do start speaking up each time, it gets a little bit easier. And so, you know, how many times at cocktail conversations have we heard uncomfortable things, but not spoken up for what was right. And we just let it pass saying, ah, it's a cocktail conversation. But once, once you do it, you know, it's, it's not a crime to let people know where you stand and say, I'm against racism. I'm against uh, violence against Asian American people. And that is, just speaking your truth and to, to be able to do that with the people around you who do care about you is an important step, whether it's posting something on social media. So everyone who follows, you know, the knows that you care about this issue or at a cocktail conversation when, when there's something passively slipped in that's that's racist, just, just not let it slip by, not necessarily make a huge deal about it, but to 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 let your opinion be known so that it changes the course of the conversation. These are small ways that we can speak up if you don't have the platforms that a politician does or someone like me does. Uh, does? Yes. So 
um, find whatever it is that you can do. Andy, what kind of advice would you give to um, uh, younger folks? Yeah, so, um, you know, definitely snaps to what Marilyn and Daniel said. I won't repeat that. But let me come and go kind of add another element to it. Um, when I think about what my theory of change is in terms of the change that I want to see happen, uh, the way I sort of describe it is that the change is not going to occur quickly. And it's also not going to occur just by mobilizing the Korean American community alone. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when I think about that, I always think about how do you sustain? So, yes, we've had a tremendous amount of energy yep. and focus and attention in this country this year, perhaps the largest during my lifetime. Mm -hmm. But if you're constantly trying to build off of the energy and attention after tragedies and after yeah. incidents like that, you're not going to be able to sustain it. We need to find a way to mobilize beyond headlines and be able to uh, understand how it is that you can create that kind of higher baseline of engagement. So that's one aspect of it. And, and that requires infrastructure. That requires yeah. social groups, communities. Yeah. It requires, you know, you know, Daniel and I, we've been engaged on a lot of these talks about how do you build that across different sectors and yeah. different industries. So that's one thing. The second thing is it's I really don't think uh, – we really need to think about coalition building. You know, and that's a word that, – you know, coalition is a word that I use with – you know, the work that I did as a diplomat or anything else, <laughs> I don't think you can get anything done in this era, especially in such a diverse country like ours, yeah. unless you build coalitions. And you have to be thoughtful about this, and you have to recognize if you want someone to be there for you, you better be there for them. Right. And, 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 and you got to be thinking about that in, in a very real way, in a way that is not just transactional, but but is based off of something deeper. And the more that we can frame ourselves in that direction, I think the greater success that we will have. So, you know, to what Marilyn was saying earlier, when, the, when there was the March for Black Lives, you know, are you there? You know, are you there? Are you present? Are you, are, are you an ally? Are you someone that's going to be uh, connecting on that level? And then it's up to us to, to explain and to showcase uh, why it is that we need other people to, to come to our efforts and to, to be able to mobilize in that way. So th those are the two things in particular, coalition building uh, for with others, as well as you know, sustainment of the attention and the energy going forward. Okay, so we're, we're going to have to wrap up now as much as I would love to continue the conversation. And I note that uh, folks, we have a chat function um, that you can exchange ideas as we go through this as well. But um, I'd like, um, we've got about 30 seconds for each of you. So I, I wanna end with this. What are the two takeaways you would like our audience to keep with them after they've had this program with you and they've heard from you? What are the two things you want them to make sure that they don't forget? And um, Daniel, why don't you go ahead? I would say, as Asian Americans, we can we we, ha, we must stop underestimating ourselves. We mm -hmm. have to stop thinking, well, we're visitors in this country. We're we're mm -hmm. we're not real Americans because as much as we uh, you know take issue with people saying that about us, especially the first generation immigrant mentality mm -hmm. is one where we should not expect anything from this country. We're we're we should just go along to get along. And we, we deserve and we've earned more than that. So we shouldn't underestimate our power. The second thing is, once you've not underestimated your power, what are you going to do about it? 23 million people in this country and growing, as Marilyn said. We are, we are a force, whether we recognize it or not. And how are we going to be a part of the solution of bringing equality, justice, not just to our community, and as Andy so rightfully alluded to, but to the, the, the problem of systemic racism in general, because we are all in this together. I think I would say, I'd start with saying, um, you know, we cannot assume that someone else will fight our fights for us. And we cannot mm -hmm. assume that, 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 you know, we're going to be on you know, the right side of history in that kind of way. You know, my, Marilyn and I, you know, every day we see how, you know, we need to 
push the Biden administration. We have to push others to be, you know, taking this account. Daniel came and testified to, you know, to make sure that, you know, people here are understanding it. I have a Democratic member, I'm not going to say who it is, who came up to me and was like, oh, this is crazy what's happening to Asian Americans in this country. But look, the pandemic's almost over, so you'll be OK. And this was a Democrat member of Congress, wow. you know. So it shows that, like, you know, we cannot take anything for granted and we can't assume that other people will do the right thing for us so let's keep at it and the other thing that i'll just say is that some of that is going to require us to you know some some of it might be a little uncomfortable you know put ourselves in situations where we're not talking to an audience that is already jazzed about what we have to say uh, i say that as someone who's a democrat i'm one of only seven democrats left in the country that represents the district trump won my district mm. is 85 percent white less than three percent asian american um, and a lot of people certainly didn't think I could win this district. And I remember, you know, an Asian American group talking about the mobilizing roundtables and talks about, you know, being Asian American. And I said, well, why don't you come to my district? We can have, and they're like, oh, well, you don't have very many Asian Americans there. I'm like, that's exactly why they need to have that conversation here. You know, so let's not just go you know, the path of least resistance and, and, and speak to audiences only where, you know, where we know that they're going to be on board. Let's try to find some ways to be able to, you know, to, to push out that, that boundary and, and, and put ourselves sometimes in a, in a little bit more of a tighter situation. But th that's where a lot of the excitement can actually happen. Marilyn, you've got the last word. So I'm going to build on what Andy said. And often when you're a person of color and you're the only one in the room, you don't want to be that minority. Don't be afraid to be that minority and speak up, especially when you are outnumbered dramatically. I think that's one thing. And number two, I have to get political here. Every time there is an open seat for office, whether it's school board, city council, the mayor's office, state legislature, governor's office, Congress, we have to field credible candidates who can compete and win. We have to be present and we can't have these giant gaps in representation. I've said this to my African-American community, we have to be present. And so let's just make sure that we are building a bench for the future so that we don't have to keep having conversations about where's our representation. It should be standard. Okay, so um, thank you, Congresswoman Marilyn Strickland, Congressman Andy Kim and Daniel Day Kim. Um, thank you so much for sharing your personal stories with us. Thank you for being amazing role models. Um, and thank you for inspiring us. Um, we need you, best wishes, and, and thank you very much.